Good evening, everybody. It's very good to see you all here. Do come on in if you're out in the foyer. Come and make your way in. Find a seat, plenty of room. It is really good to be with you. It's the, welcome to the 6.30 service. My name's Claire, and um, we're really looking forward to worshipping with you and getting to know you a little bit and uh, just spending some time talking and thinking and praying. So what I'm going to ask you to do is stand with me, and um, we're going to start with worship in just a moment. The first thing we're going to do, though, is have a little moment of quiet. Yeah, why don't you just, uh, if you want to, if you're comfortable, just close your eyes and just turn your heart towards God and, and I'm going to pray. Father God, thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you promised that you will always be with us and we believe that you're here now. And over this next little while, we want to turn to you for help and strength for encouragement, but also for vision and wisdom for how to lead our lives well. And so we come to you now, God, for the answers and for the peace and the joy that you promise us. And we come in worship now, worship of King Jesus. We turn to you, God. Amen.
and we love joining together to worship you, to give it our all. We love you, God. You are the King. We've come to worship you. We've come to sing about you, King Jesus, the amazing, remarkable Jesus. Lift up your prayer.
place. We say you have the preeminent place. For at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, we honor you in this place.
are the Lord of all creation. You are the God of the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud in the Old Testament. You're, you're the God who parted the Red Sea. And you're the God who sent Jesus, our Savior, to earth to show us the way to show us the way to you, Father. That he would hang on a cross for us, for our sins, for my sin, for all my failures and flaws, he seen them all. Just as we come to the end of worship, I just want to um, get you to think for a minute on what are you pinning your hopes on today? Honestly, what do you pin your hopes on in your life? You know, there's, the Bible tells us that Jesus came into Jerusalem a few days before his death, knowing he was going to his death. And a group of people came with him, praising him, and they met the people of the city and the people in the city were saying, who is it? And the people with Jesus were saying, it's Jesus the prophet. And the atmosphere was electric. Everyone thought this was a moment where everything was going to change and all their hopes rose. And I just want to ask you what your hopes are pinned on today. Because for Jesus, he knew exactly what was going to, how it was going to roll out. He knew where he was going. He knew that he was going to his death. But those people, they, some of them were just caught up in a moment. And they were hoping for all sorts of things, for strength, redemption, deliverance, good stuff for their families, peace, joy, all the stuff that humans want. But there's only one person really in those Bible accounts that knows what to do in that electric atmosphere. And it's Jesus. And he was going to follow through and take humanity where it had no idea where it was going. And today, Jesus says to you, you can pin your hopes on me. Whether you're pinning your hopes on your skill or the things that you hope will get you through life, Jesus is a sure and certain hope. Whoever you are, wherever you're at, there is someone who knows what is going on. <laughs> And I thank you, God, that here in this room, you know everything about every person here. And you have given us something in Jesus. It's a hope that, the book of Hebrews calls it a hope that anchors our souls. And I just want to, you to take a moment and offer internally, God, a little prayer of gratitude. That you will like, your life is not dependent on the sway of human opinions or things that happen on the political stage or even things that happen to you personally. Those things can take your life through all sorts of a roller coaster. But there is one who will anchor your soul through every season of life. And he is here today. He knows your name and he loves you. So we thank you, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the hope that you give us. We anchor ourselves in you today. We anchor ourselves in the hope that you give us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.
Um, and yeah, thank you, Abby and the team for leading us in worship. And just want to say another welcome to you today. My name's Claire Thompson, part of the team here at Woody's. And if you're here for the first time, you are very, very welcome. We always have visitors here and we do want to make you feel welcome and just feel at home amongst us. So if you are new or newish around here and you want to find out a little bit more about how Woodlands Church works and how you can get involved and how you can get to know people, how we get to know you, we have a, a few ways of um, helping you into that process. And it's really just to sign our contact form and it just gives us a little bit of detail about you so that we can get in touch with you. You won't be signing up to anything that you can't unsign for. Um, there's a QR code that will come up right now. And if you scan that, that'll help you in or you can talk to our welcomers after the service on the desk outside in the foyer or go on our website. And we just want to encourage you to do that. And there are lots of things that you can join in with in this church. And we want to get to know you and we hope you want to get to know us. So that is, um, that is for you to do if you'd like to do it. Cut one notice from me and then again, get Dave up. Um, but today is Palm Sunday. You aware of that? We, uh, it's the evening service, there's not so many children around. In the morning, it's very Palm Sunday-ish. But today is the day at the beginning of what we call Holy Week. Now, Holy Week is um, a name that is given to this week the last that commemorates the last week of Jesus' life before his death and then consequent resurrection. And so every day this week, we are going to be tracking with the story of Jesus' last week of his life on earth. And in that time, we're going to be visiting some of the things that have happened to Jesus in his life. And so we've got some on our social media, we've got some little videos um, and I encourage you to check in on those midday, a little thought for the day just to help us track with Holy Week. On Tuesday evening, we've got a praise and worship night here in the building. It'll be really wonderful just to gather together, to pray, to think, maybe to meditate a little bit on those events of Holy Week. And then on Friday morning, it's Good Friday, and we have a service here at 10.30 on Good Friday. It's a, again, a slightly different flavor to this sort of service. It's bit of a meditation and we we just take some time to really think about that amazing story of what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross then next week it's all sorts of things happening it's it's Easter day we've got baptisms and it's going to be wonderful to be together on Easter day so I just encourage you to track with Holy Week there's some Bible readings that you can do that just take us through the, the week together. And in fact, if you do that, you will be doing it in the company of millions of people around the world who for centuries since Jesus died have tracked with that story in Holy Week. And so we'll be in company with millions of other people doing that. So I just want to encourage you to do that. Dave, got a bit of a special evening this evening. And so Dave's going to explain what is going on. Thank you, Claire. Well, just again, I want to add my own welcome to you if you're here um, as a visitor. My name is Dave. I'm the team leader for the Woodland Church family. And um, this evening, I want to give a little shout out to Candice. She went to America and she came back. Whoa. Um, but uh, in terms of newcomers, once a month we have a newcomers event during the evening service. That gives us, us a chance to tell a bit of our story to you about why the Woodland Church family exists how you can get more connected if you'd like to. It doesn't commit you to anything, but it's going to happen during the sermon tonight. It will be happening in the crypt, which is downstairs. There will be scones and cake and coffee, a presentation and a chance for anyone who's a visitor just to hear a bit of our story and to think, well, is this a church I'd like to get more involved with? And if so, what are the pathways to do that? So if that is relevant to you, then I'll be going downstairs and you can... Uh, we'll, we'll give you a clear direction when that's going to happen. But as um, Claire said, it's Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, we remember how Jesus was welcomed into a city, into the holy city, into Jerusalem, and welcomed in such a way that there was an impact on that whole city. The whole city was stirred. And it's, it's really quite fitting in, in a way that, that today we've got some guests here who are servants of our city. And uh, Rob Scott Cook, who's going to be speaking tonight and who kicked off the whole Woodland Church family back in the day. In fact, when Rob was in the 1960s, came here as a student. In the 1960s, I think, uh, I'm sure I'm right about that. And, um, and I think that Rob 
in his ministry in, in, in uh, our city, he's always had a heart much more than just being a local church minister, very much a city church minister, wanting to have a heart for the whole of Bristol. And as such, has made some really significant relationships, not least with some of our guests who are here tonight. And so what we're going to do this evening is to, um, I suppose, reflect what does it mean for Jesus to enter Bristol right now? What does it mean for us to welcome Jesus into our city? And we all have a responsibility to do that. But we're going to hear from some of those, some of those people are guests, they're not part of our church family, but they're good friends. And others are members of our church family who right now are, are, are kind of pivot moments in terms of serving the city. It's particularly wonderful to have um, Marvin uh, in, in, in just the final months of his uh, tenure as mayor with us. And um, Marvin, I know that you've been a real inspiration to so many people, and including myself. But Rob, just why don't you come up and um, introduce this next section to us. Let's give Rob a little round of applause. Um, Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> well, it's great to be here and to be here together on Palm Sunday. As Dave said, it was that amazing story of how Jesus triumphantly enters the city and yet so humbly riding on a donkey. And the whole of the city, it says in Matthew 21, verse 10, that the whole city was stirred. We want to think a little bit tonight on this Palm Sunday of what does it mean for us to have a, a kingdom impact on a city, to be able to have a significant input. And so we've invited a, a number of people tonight to share with us. Particularly, we want to thank God for Marvin's faithful service. When we think of welcoming Jesus into the city on Palm Sunday, the day when Marvin was first elected for mayor, he's now served two, two terms as mayor, but the first day, that evening, he met with a small group of leaders in the city. And this is what he said. He said, you know, as mayor, as city mayor, I'm able to invite some really significant VIPs into the city, but the first VIP I want to invite to the city is the Holy Spirit to come and to impact this city. And it's been wonderful to sense that heart for the city and the kingdom of God. So let's just welcome Marvin and his wife, Kirsten, here tonight. So. <clears throat> we are particularly keen to include Kirsten as well because uh, she's been so supportive during this time. And for them as a family, at times it's been quite challenging, and even threatening with all that goes on sometimes in social media and other ways in the city. So we want to feel we were thanking them both for their amazing service to the city. And Marvin has helped champion during his term of service that whole vision of Bristol as a city of hope. So I'm just going to ask you, Marvin, maybe for a few minutes, if you could share with us what, in championing that Bristol City of Hope, is the kind of legacy that you'd love to feel you're leaving for the city? Okay, so, so um, I think the reason we settled on hope came from another of points. I think I shared here before that I've always had a fascination with the idea of hope. I, I don't like optimism. I find hope being more substantial. It grapples with suffering. I was saying this to you, Rob. We were meeting for years before I was elected, before the 12. You were saying the same thing. My concern was if I started talking about hope, they're going to think I'm a pan shop Obama, like I'm trying to copy. That's what my trolls will start to say. Uh, so we kind of kept it quiet. But there was a day, wasn't it, when Rockefeller Resilient Cities was in town, and they were talking about uh, resilience, the whole global movement on resilient cities. And in the interview, I said, well, if you want to know what it is to be resilient, you've got, you got to know what it is to suffer. And if you suffer, you learn to persevere. <laughs> persevere, preserves character, character, hope. And I used it for the first time, and then we used it over at um, a, a crisis center as well, which is now Hope Ministries. And so the idea of really making a statement about Bristol being a city of hope began to really solidify, and then you brought it home really at a city gathering when you brought the plaque down declaring Bristol's city of hope and the idea is that wherever anyone's born, I mean I'm obviously folk, I focus on disadvantage and so forth, but whatever status anyone is born to in Bristol they, ha they can have a hope that there are people and uh, services and relationships that can make sure that tomorrow is better than today. Wonderful. Well, we're so grateful to God for your faithful service and to you, Kirsten, for all your support in that. 
We'd love just to be able to thank God together. Maybe if I'm going to pray for Marvin and Kirsten, maybe just reach out a hand towards them as I do that and sense that we're together in the city saying thank you to God. Lord, we do thank you for Marvin's terms of service and for the remarkable work he has done in the city. We thank you for Kirsten, for the family. Continue to pray your protection over them, your blessing on them, Lord. And pray now that you'd come by your spirit, Lord, for whatever the next step is. May they sense your spirit guiding them, just as they invited you, Holy Spirit, into this city. So we pray for your continued work in this city, building it as a city of hope, a city of refuge. Come now, Lord, we pray by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you both. Bless you. Let's just express our appreciation. One of the things we wanted to do as well tonight, as we're really going to miss Marvin, the role he's had in the city, but we didn't want to feel that was the end of an era. We want to feel that somehow he's left something of a legacy too that we can build on. And so he's inspired the next generation. And particularly, it's wonderful tonight for us to pray for a number of followers of Jesus who have felt that call of God into serving the city in different ways. So we've invited one, two, three, four of them here tonight. And I'm going to invite them all up now. That's be Richard and Rachel and... Andrew and Ed, and um, Richard particularly, we, we're suggesting you may notice this special garb that he's not, he doesn't normally wear this on a Sunday, but uh, there's a bit of a kind of regal. So R Richard has just become the high sheriff of Bristol. Now you may wonder whatever that role is. So he literally represents royalty here and has a significant role in the city. And it's wonderful to feel it's a, as a follower of Jesus, he's wanted to really feel he could serve in this role. So we're going to pray for him in that. And then I'll introduce the others as well as to what they're doing too. So I'm going to get Andrew maybe just to come and pray for Richard. That was okay. I'm feeling, feeling slightly underdressed here, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> You're showing me up as usual. Thank you. Let me pray for this man, and um, maybe you'd also like to reach out to, uh, to Richard, and uh, I want to thank you for Richard, um, I count you as a friend, Richard, I've known you a long time, and I've seen the way that you have served this city well, that you have sought to reach out to the most disadvantaged in this city in remarkable ways. Um, and I do sense, even as we've just shared about um, uh, that word hope, I, I was just sitting there and saying, what, what is the word? Uh, to pray into Richard's life in this year that he's going to be uh, serving you as High Sheriff. And it was that word hope. And I have a real sense, Richard, that as you uh, make your many visits across the city in different situations, different parts of the city, at a time when the city is under such pressure, there's so, much, so many challenges in different parts of the city, in the south of the city, in the north of the city, in the centre of the city. Um, and uh, in, in your position, very much in a, in a sense, in a legal sense uh, as well, that you be able to, every meeting you have, every gathering you speak into, that you would bring that word of hope. And I pray, Lord, by your spirit, that you would continue to fill this man, that he would know a real sense of wisdom, uh, a real sense of, of boldness, but also a real sense of bringing that message of hope in the way that he reaches out and speaks into the lives of people right across every community in this city. Would you bless him? We thank you for him. And we pray your anointing on him now, Lord, in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Stay with us, Richard. We're going to, in a moment, uh, take a chance of commissioning them all in that role and feel that we together, as the people of God, are, are praying over them. But, uh, Rachel, I'm going to get you maybe just to come up next. And um, uh, Rachel has just become the chair of 125, which is a remarkable project here in the city, working among working women. But maybe just a moment, just tell us a little bit what's involved as 125 in your role. Um, so 125 is a charity that uh, has its uh, origins in wonderful faithful women in our city who established it nearly 30 years ago to reach out to marginalised women who have suffered significant disadvantage and are either street working or at risk of street working. It's a phenomenal charity and I um, am really privileged to have just been appointed as the chair of the board of trustees, so leading the charity. So it's a real honor and a real privilege. And if I can ask for a couple of prayer points, is that all right? So um, one, that as a charity, we'd have a real impact on, in the lives of the women that we serve, that our team who are working hard would be blessed and encouraged in their work, but we'd have real impact. 
but I'd really like to invite you to stand with us as a charity as we campaign against injustice. So I'd really like to ask you to pray for the charity, but also to use your voice where you're able to. So join us on social media, make a big noise. We want to really campaign against the injustice that these women um, experience. Thank you, Rachel. Now, Ed and Andrew, uh, I should say that Rachel is part of the Highgrove congregation, the Woody's Highgrove over at Sea Mills, and Ed and Andrew are part of, High, uh, a part of Woodlands Central here and the Woodlands family, and it's been great to see again. I won't, they could spend all evening telling you what they do because they do such remarkable things, but Ed, Ed has particularly had a role with regard to housing, net zero in the city, social enterprise, creating opportunities of work, of housing, of homes, in a safe, healthy environment and has had some amazing, huge projects around the city. And so he is chief executive of that and particularly as a Christian is seeking to serve God in that way. And one of the things we want tonight to sense, we're just taking a few folk with their roles, but for all of us, we can have an impact on our city. And we want to think a little bit tonight about what that means. So we're going to pray for Ed in a moment and for Andrew. Andrew, again, has had so many roles in the city, but recently has just become the chair of what's known as the Bristol Charities. Um, the Bristol Charities is the oldest of charities, I say in the city, most likely one of the oldest in the world. It's over 600 years old and brings together many, many different charities of the years. It was once the main Bristol City or Bristol Corporation charity. And uh, now Andrew is heading that up together with a, an amazing team seeking to make a difference in our city, and particularly sensing what may be the fresh ways they could do that at this time. So we're going to pray for them. And uh, what we're going to do, I think, is lovely to feel that we could be commissioning them in the, that role. So I'm going to take my little cruise of oil, which I often used in anointing, particularly when there's a sense of a, a new role. So with a new appointing, there's a kind of new anointing. So let's stand together. Let's reach out towards them. And uh, as we do that, I'm just going to pray over them and just pray for that fresh anointing of God's Holy Spirit upon them. In a moment, I'm going to be sharing with you what I feel is a kind of prophetic word for this year. And it's very much about that fresh wave of God's Spirit. So as we're going to pray for them now. Father, we take this oil now as a simple symbol of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And for Richard, as he takes up this role of High Sheriff, I pray there'll be a real sense of a fresh anointing of your Spirit upon him. We take this oil now, Lord, and anoint you, Richard, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord. Fill him afresh. And for you, Rachel, as you take up your role, and particularly that heart for justice, for those who are marginalized and challenged, I just pray now that God will strengthen you in that, give you real wisdom, and you'll be able to motivate and mobilize across this city a heart for those women. Come now, Lord, by your Spirit, as we take this oil, we pray, a fresh anointing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Fill her afresh, Lord. Fill her to overflowing in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you so much for Ed and already for the remarkable work he's done in the city, helping to provide homes and jobs, a healthier environment. Come now, Lord, I pray. Come by your Spirit. We anoint you, Ed, now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Fill him afresh, Lord. Fill him to overflowing, we pray. In Jesus' name. And again, we're so grateful for all you've already been doing in the city, but we're praying for this new role, for a fresh anointing. We take this oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit and anoint you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God of hope, fill this your servant with all joy and peace as he trusts in you that he may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' lovely and precious name. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's again just express our appreciation to all of these. As they... That's great. What a, what a fantastic... Um... In a way, symbol of so many other people, and I know that there are people all over this room who uh, are serving God in our city in all kinds of ways, so thank you. And there is a call for all of us to know what part we get to play. In, it might be just in our neighborhood, in our community. It might be in volunteering, one of the many 
charities we support. It might be going to schools with Transforming Lives for Good. It might be fostering a child. There's so many things that uh, people are doing, and we're so grateful for your part and partnership in all of that as well. So in a moment, too, Rob's going to come and, and preach to us. Um, if you would like to come to Newcomers, we're going to go downstairs now. And just to make that easy, I'd love you all to turn up, turn around, say hi to someone sitting around you so that we're all standing busing together, and then we'll hand back to Claire just to take us on and introduce you to So everybody stand up. If you came to Newcomers, this is your time to leave your seat, to come down into the comfort and bowels of the building. Okay, everybody. Right, everyone, that is it. Chatting time is over. You've had a good long chat. Let's, let's come back together. And uh, in just a moment, we're going to hear Rob preach, but I'm going to ask Dan to come up, and he is going to read for us. So get ready to hear a bit of the Bible read to you. This is Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. They took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Just wonder, there he is. <laughs> oh, I thought he disappeared on us. Thank you. 
So that was a glimpse of that Palm Sunday, that first Palm Sunday. And it was an amazing event when Jesus entered the city. It says in that verse 10 of that chapter that the whole city was stirred. Jesus coming had a huge kingdom impact on the city. And we've been thinking a little already tonight of what does it mean today to have a kingdom impact on the city? And it's not just those who hold high office. What could it mean for all of us, all of us as followers of Jesus, to have a kingdom impact on the city? And here's one of the key ways in which it happens. And I want to share a kind of prophetic word I felt for this year for us as church. And it's these simple words where I feel God has been promising that we should in 2024 expect a fresh wave of the Holy Spirit in prayer. Not just in prayer, also in terms of worship and witness, words, works, wonders, way of life. But tonight, we're just going to look at the first of those and even just a glimpse of it. We'll do more of it later in the year. It is through prayer that we can have a significant impact on the city. The psalmist says, you know, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen watch in vain. What does it mean for us to be watchmen with Jesus watching over the city. You know, Jesus often asks his disciples to watch and pray. And yet, as we think of Easter, one of the most poignant moments when Jesus asked the disciples to watch and pray was when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, agonizing over the cross and all that lay ahead of him. And he calls the disciples and takes three of them aside, Peter, James, and John. He says to them, watch and pray with me. He goes away and begins to pray, falls to the ground. He sweats great drops of blood. We know that under intense anguish, it's possible through our temples, it were literally to sweat blood. So deep was that scent of agony and anguish. And he comes back to find the disciples who he'd asked to pray, and they're fast asleep. Do you ever fall asleep when you're trying to pray? If you're honest, do you find sometimes you're too tired to pray? Do you find you easily get distracted or discouraged, maybe because you haven't seen answers to your prayers. See, what Jesus said to the disciples there in the garden were amazing words. He said this to them. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is the greatest challenge to our prayer life. Sometimes we feel a heartache, a stirring in prayer, but there's the weakness of human flesh. We easily get distracted, we get tired, we get discouraged. And I just want to unfold briefly tonight a key verse of, verse of scripture that gives us an insight into how we could have a kingdom impact on this city through prayer. But our own personal lives, our family life, our homes, our communities, prayer is such a powerful thing when we understand how it works. So I'm going to just look for a moment at this verse, or these two verses in Romans chapter 8 and reading verses 26 and 27. This is where it explains to us how God helps us in our weakness. So Jesus said, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And here in Romans it says, in the same way the spirit helps us in our weakness. When we're feeling tired, we don't feel like praying those are the very times to pray, but we need the help of the Holy Spirit in it. We do not know what we ought to pray. Well, that makes it even more difficult. Do you know times when you feel stirring about something and you don't know what to pray? You don't know what God's will would be for that situation? You're struggling, as it were? Here is how the Holy Spirit helps us. And it's amazing. It goes on to say, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And... He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with God's will. So how does this work? Here I am, I'm feeling tired, I'm feeling, I don't feel like praying, I'm struggling. I don't even know what I ought to pray for this person, maybe in my family or around me or in a need I've heard of. In a I don't know what to pray, so what's the point of praying? But then I sense that fresh wave of God's Holy Spirit. Over these past few months of this year, I have felt wave after wave of the Holy Spirit in prayer, in praying with my spirit, in praying in the spirit, in praying with the help of the Holy Spirit. It makes all the difference. But Rob, if you don't know what you ought to pray, what's the point of trying to pray? 
But this is how it works, you see. Many years ago, we sent a young couple out to uh, missionary work in Africa. It was a really challenging situation in Central Africa, and um, it was a dangerous situation. We were praying for them every day, just a young couple. And this particular week, we had them on our hearts every day, and um, all, all one day, I remember feeling a real heartache for them, but not knowing what was happening. They were miles away. I hadn't any contact with them for weeks. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and then on my mind, I just can't, I can't get back to sleep. I'm, I, I feel a real ache in my heart for them, and yet I don't know what to pray. And then I sensed the Holy Spirit welling up inside. And I felt like those groanings too deep for words, that sense of praying with your spirit, where you feel a release of the Holy Spirit in prayer. And I'm praying for them. I'm really feeling God at work. Somehow is at work in them. And, and so in the morning, I couldn't wait to be able to contact them and send them a message, which I did do. It took a little while to get to them in Central Africa and a little while for their message to come back. I told them what had happened. I told them even what time I'd been woken up and how I'd been praying. And, I felt... and then their message came back. And it was amazing. They said, Rob, you can't imagine just how encouraging it was to hear from you. That night, we were traveling from Central Africa down to South Africa on a road that is known as a kind of death trap because you have these great juggernauts that travel down through, often with no lights on, and you're on a road. He said, we were traveling along literally in the middle of the night. And as we were, this huge juggernaut came. We we, we were sure this is the end of it. We even looked at each other, this is going to be the end. And in fact, it was a fatal accident just there to happen, but we managed just to skirt around it. And as we got through it, we stopped the car. We looked at each other, we looked at our watches. We said to each other, someone somewhere must be praying for us. It was the exact time that I had sent them that message to say, I've been praying for them. Now, you might well say those who are a bit kind of, and I said, oh, Rob, if God is the God Almighty of the universe, the creator, the, why does he need to wake you up in the early hours of the morning? Couldn't he have just done it? He could have, but... Here's this great truth about prayer, that the sovereign Lord does none of his purposes on earth without revealing them through his people, and prayer is the key way in which God does it. So this is what makes prayer so exciting. It's not just a shopping list of needs that I've got, but it's being part of the eternal purpose of God, that God is unfolding his purpose on earth, revealing those purposes, and through prayer, engaging us in it. See, God has a plan and purpose for your life, for my life, for our church, for your church, for this city, for this community, for our family. You see, the Palm Sunday story tells you in such an amazing way this glimpse of God's plan and purpose. Even through suffering and heartache, I mean, the cross was such a gruesome, painful, passionate experience. And yet somehow God was at work in it, ultimately bringing glory and the wonder of salvation, forgiveness. But it was a painful process. In our city, we've been going through challenging times, difficult times. And yet, if God is watching over this city, what does it mean to catch a glimpse of God's purposes? See, many times in Jesus' life, uh, even his own brothers at one stage were trying to precipitate him. Go up to Jerusalem now, they said. And Jesus said these amazing words. He said, but my hour has not yet come. Your hour has not come. Well, there's part of a purpose and a plan. And then eventually, as you come to this Palm Sunday, Jesus says to his disciples, the hour has come. This is the moment. This is to be the fulfillment of the ages. This is the watershed of history, which we even, in history, we date our systems as B.C. and A.D. This was the moment in history. And Jesus, it wasn't just the overall plan, but even the details of it. So Palm Sunday, he says to to two of his disciples, he says, there's a village just up ahead. They said, how are we going to plan for the Passover? He said, look, go to the village up ahead, and when you get there, you'll find a donkey tied up, and it'll have its coat with it, untie it. Well, well, how can we do that? We don't... I mean, the, 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 the owner may say, what are you doing? He said, they will say to you what you're doing. You just say to them that Jesus has need of it, and you bring it here. And then the scripture goes on to say, in that very passage in Matthew 21, this was to fulfill what the scriptures had said. So right back in Zechariah, hundreds of years before, it had predicted this is how it's going to be. He's going to come riding on a donkey. But such details, such momentary things, yes. God has a plan and purpose for our lives, for our world, for our city. It's through prayer that we're part of that release of God's purposes. How does it work? What does it mean that God stirs in you a a heartache for a situation. It may be a situation of injustice that we see around us, etc. 
how do we pray into it? Because we're not even sure what the answer would be. You no, know God's will. This is how he says. And so again, th- th- those words, we just put them out again in, in, in Romans chapter 8. It describes the process that happens. It says literally, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our week. We do not know what we ought to pray. For the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. What does that mean? In fact, it's interesting. The word that is used in the Greek here is the word glossalia. It's the common word used in the New Testament for tongues. In fact, F.F. F. Bruce was one of those famous, well, um, one of those world-famous theologians, in fact, and uh, particularly on scriptural text authenticity and uh, authority of scripture. And uh, he himself says concerning this verse that this not only describes the inner groanings and heart feelings when you're feeling stirred about something, but it also refers to what we read of in Corinthians chapter 14, the experience of tongues, where a person finds that they're praying out of an inner groaning and aching, and yet it's a language that's not their own language. Now, some of you may think, oh, Rob, that sounds a bit strange. In fact, some people get very nervous about that. Even sometimes some folks feel, oh, that would be the devil, you know, something like that, because God is a creation, a God of creative order. He's a God who's made us rational creatures, articulate, able to express our feelings. That's part of the uniqueness of humanity compared with the animal world is that we can, we can explain and articulate our thoughts. But that's not the only way in which we give expression to our feelings. Let's take... Two extremes of human expression of passion and feeling. The first is, let's take joy, humor, fun. Now, I'm not very good at telling jokes, but I could tonight tell you the finest joke you've ever heard, the funniest joke you've ever heard. And I get to the strap line. You know, it's like when you say the strap line. And and as I say the strap line, because you're all articulate, rational creatures, you would just sit there with pan faces and saying, oh, that's funny, that's funny. Now, I heard a few little ripples there. What was this, what was this wordless ripple that I'm hearing? What is this inarticulate expression? We call it laughter. Laughter, yes. It's a real expression. In fact, it's where, uh, beyond words, we're expressing a deep feeling, often of joy or excitement or fun or laughter and Let's take the other extreme, because it's even more poignant. The sense of sadness, suffering, heartache, grief. Now again, we're articulate creatures, rational creatures. I could tell you the saddest news you've ever heard in your life today. And you could all sit there and say, that is sad, that is sad, that is sad. That would be a rational, articulate response. But in fact, to express deep feelings sometimes, we cry, we weep, we sob deeply sometimes. Now, it's interesting that our background, our history, our culture can shape how we give expression to those feelings. You may be brought up in a very serious home where in fact laughter is seen as frivolous. And so you wouldn't laugh too often. You may be brought up with a macho image of a culture where you'd never cry. It doesn't mean that you couldn't laugh or you couldn't cry. We all got tear ducts, all of us. But if this is true of human passions, of joy or of sadness, the limitation of expression is not just articulate language that's funny or that's sad. It's a release from our inner being of laughter or of sadness. Then how much more for our spirit, our inner being, when we feel we're bursting at the seams in worship and words seem so limited. Or when we're in prayer, we're feeling that aching of heart and longing and deep, there's those deep groanings. It shouldn't surprise us that that same God of creation has made it possible for us to know an inner release of our spirit in which we pray with our spirit, which we sing with our spirit. I've known what it is sometimes to pray with folk. I still remember praying with a person who was a, already was a church leader, but he'd been brought up in a, a, a lovely home. I'm a, a familiar with the family, in fact, but a fairly serious family, a traditional family, who most likely may have even been a bit suspicious about tongues or something like that. And, and he'd be brought him in that environment where he'd never, never, ever heard it. 
until he met with some friends who were really alive in the spirit. And he felt there was something there. And he asked if he could come and see me. He came to see me. We spent a long time opening the scriptures together, explaining to what it meant. And he said, Rob, I, I'm fearful of what it would mean. But he said, I, I'm open. I said, well, would you like me to pray for you? And just like tonight, I prayed. I, I got out my little cruise of oil. And uh, I, I, we, we sat on the sofa. And I was sat in the chair here. And he stood up in front of the sofa. And I, I said, I'm going to take this oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And as I anoint you with it, I'm going to pray for God to fill you and release something in you. And as I prayed for him, literally as I prayed, he fell back into that sofa and began to sob and sob and sob. He said, Rob, it's not sadness, he said. He said, I haven't cried for 21 years. But I just felt something deep within me released today. He's a leader of a large senior church today, but... There's a sense in which God released something in him of his spirit. God longs for us to know what it is, to know that fresh wave of God's spirit. The Holy Spirit helping us in our weakness. We don't know what to pray. And yet, this is what it explains again. If we put that back up again, because it goes on to explain. See, when I'm praying for that couple in Africa, I don't know what God's will is for them. I just know that on my heart, I can feel a real ache that God's put on my heart. So... But this is the pure, the wonderful, this passage of scripture is the most significant passage in the Bible in explaining how, how prayer works, that praying. If he goes on to say this, it says that uh, because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with God's will, he who searches our hearts. So God searches my heart. He can sense that ache that he's put there. And I really am genuinely aching and feeling for that person. But I don't know what God's will is for them. But the Holy Spirit is interceding in me according to God's will. So I am caught up in God's eternal purposes through that work of God's spirit in me. There's something very wonderful when we begin to have a confidence in prayer. You know, sometimes we pray, and if we haven't had the answer to the prayer after a week, we feel God hasn't heard our prayer. After a month, we've given up on it, stopped praying, and after a few months, we've even forgotten our prayer. By the time God answers our prayer, perhaps in a different way to what we expected, we don't even recognize the answer. What is it to persist in prayer? So that Paul says, and it's interesting in Scripture, because we don't have any record of Paul actually speaking in tongues. And yet Paul himself says, I speak in tongues more than any of you. So it must have been something in his personal life and walk with God that really had that release of God's Spirit in prayer in him. But how does that work? What does it mean then to, to sense God's spirit stirring in us in prayer, that fresh wave of God's spirit in prayer? In Philippians chapter 1, it has this amazing verse where Paul is speaking about his own prayer life. And he says, first of all, he says, I thank my God in all my prayers for you. Whenever I pray for you, I always pray with joy. Now, that in itself is really interesting. I've often said that Paul always prays with joy. Surely not. I mean, prayers of perseverance at times are hard, it's hard going. No, I always pray with joy. But I'm confident of this, and it's this confidence that makes a difference in prayer. I'm confident that he who began a good work will bring it to completion. Really? You mean when you sense that heartache, that stirring of God's spirit, and you begin to pray that God will bring it? Yes. Now, it's an amazing story. There are many amazing stories of George Muller here in this city and uh, the, the impact he had. He had an amazing kingdom impact on this whole city, particularly through prayer. In fact, he had a global impact eventually. Still even now, though that was hundreds of years ago, still today, people's prayer life has been stirred by that story. And here's just one of the stories. See, what happened with George Muller? He kept a diary. Now, my little diary, I can keep in my pocket, but he, he kept what we call a journal. And, you know, you can still see those journals today. In fact, if you haven't ever visited, up Muller Road, which is in the day was the longest road in Bristol, was named after him. So up Muller Road, if you look up above, uh, still the original orphanages, where he, he cared for thousands of orphans, just purely through prayer God, of God's provision. But you keep a record of those prayers. And this was um, back in November 1844. And that day he felt God stirring five people to pray for. None of them were Christians. But he felt a commitment, a heartache for them. And he decided he would pray every day for them. And so he writes in his journal. You can still see it today. He would have half the page would be his prayer request with a date. And then the other half he kept clear for when God answered the prayer and he put the date. And you can see the five names there. Well, 
It took 18 months before the first one of them became a Christian. And boy, when he became a Christian, I mean, the Bible says that all heaven rejoiced. There was much excitement and joy. You know, this week, on Tuesday evening, I shared with a number of folk just that simple prayer of faith to be able to become Christians. It was wonderful to sense. You know, a person for the first time. I often use that little booklet called Why Jesus. I think there'll be some at the back there. There we are, a little Why Jesus booklet. And it, it just explains those simple steps of becoming a Christian. Just saying sorry to God, first of all. Don't make excuses. Don't say it's not my fault. It's my upbringing. Just say sorry. And then thank Jesus for dying for you. To commit your life to him. Anyway, for George Muller, that was number one. 18 months. It was five years later before the next one. <laughs> And yet he kept praying, and in a diary, and then after five years, the next one was, and he put the name there, you can see it, in the journal. And then it was a longer time, I think, in fact, it was 11 years to the next one, and then 25 years, in fact, I was trying to think earlier today, it was 25 years for the next one. Imagine that, 25 years. I think I've told some of you the story of me praying for my younger brother for over 20 years, and uh, and for my next youngest brother, who's just, just become a Christian. That was nearly 60 years every day. That persistence in prayer, that perseverance. So for Muller, that was four of them, four of the five. And then Muller died. Now you might say, well, Rob, four or five is not bad, is it? I mean, that's, that, that's fairly good. But the promise was that God will bring to completion that which he's begun. When George Muller's funeral happened in this city, because of the kingdom impact he had had on the city, in fact, so many of the shops across the city and offices closed that day. The funeral cortege was, in fact, three miles long, right the way down to the city. And at his funeral that day, number five came to his funeral, and he became a Christian that day. Now, here's one of the wonderful things about prayer. Listen carefully. Prayer outlives the prayer. You may not realize it. You may not even know. It may be a great-grandmother of yours or an uncle. You may even know they died long ago, but their prayers may well have affected your life today. In this city, those prayers that have gone before, even prayers of George Muller for this city still today are effective. There's something amazing. I mean, if prayer, when you invest in it, you say, well, how long does prayer last for? How long are you going to... That's what it says here in Philippians chapter 1. I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion, even until the day of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, the answer to those prayers. You see, for all of us, when Jesus says, watch with me, unless the Lord watches over the city, we watch in vain, but he's calling us to be watchmen. You may not hold a high office, but you can have an impact, a kingdom impact on this city through prayer on your community, on your family, on your home, on our lives. It's that fresh wave of the Spirit in prayer that makes a difference. No matter how weak and frail you feel, the Holy Spirit helps us in that prayer. And that's my prayer tonight on this Palm Sunday, is that for all of us, like the whole city was stirred, that we could be stirred today for that fresh wave of God's Spirit. And I want to pray that tonight. I want to pray it over you. So let's just stand together, if we may. If you can't stand, that even where you're sitting, just open your hands ready to receive. I'm praying now for a fresh wave of God's Spirit upon our lives. If you long for that, if you struggle in prayer, you're only too well aware of your weaknesses and frailty, but you long to know a fresh wave of the Holy Spirit in prayer, then just be open. Just open your hands now ready to receive. God is so much more ready to give than we're ready often to receive. Here tonight, I'm going to invite now for the Holy Spirit, that fresh wave. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Fill us afresh. Spring up a well, spring up a well. From deep within those streams of living water welling up inside of us, even now, Lord, fill us to overflowing, God of hope. We want to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to sense we're part of your purposes, Lord, for this city is not just our plans, our ideas, but, Lord, your eternal plans and purposes for our lives, Lord, today. We may be struggling with questions and decisions we've got to make about life, but, Lord, if you could tell where a donkey was tied up and the hour you had to go, Lord, 
you know for our lives, Lord, every hair of our head is numbered. Renew in us that confidence in prayer, Lord. Come, come Holy Spirit. Lord, we're expecting now that fresh wave. I ask now in Jesus' name, for each one of us stood before you open, ready to receive, or if we're sat receiving, Lord, this week, whenever we pray, may we sense a fresh wave of your Holy Spirit in prayer. In Jesus' lovely and precious name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand back to Claire to close. But let me just say, I, I've still got a little oil left in my cruise. And I'd love to be able to pray. Any of you this evening that would love just that fresh anointing in prayer, then just come and fill one of these front seats. And I'd love to come and pray with you. Um, and just for that, simply for that fresh anointing, that fresh wave of God's Spirit. But God bless you. And this year, expect a fresh wave of the Spirit. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, that's really helpful. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we've got 10 minutes or so to go back into worship, to carry on seeking God, praying together. I'm just going to suggest a couple of things that, um, as Rob said, if you want to come and get some prayer specifically from Rob, you're really welcome to do that. And he's over here. We've also got a few people over in this side of the church. If you want prayer for anything at all, it's very normal for us in this church to pray for one another. Another thing you can do is if you know the people next to you and you're comfortable, why don't you just pray with each other? And as we worship, if you've got something that is on your heart, something that you really feel like you need God to help you with or to, you want to thank God for, then just um, get together and pray with one another. And we're going to spend about the next 10 minutes or so worshipping, praying, and really expecting God to meet with us. So that's all going to happen right now as we go back into worship. Do come and find Rob or us at the front here.
than we've ever known before. Spirit of God, would you increase in this place? Would you come and touch our bodies, our minds, where they need renewing, our souls, Yeah. Mm-hmm.
break out. Spirit, break out in this city. Spirit, break out in our lives, in our family lives, in our workplaces. Spirit, break out amongst our friendship groups. Spirit of God, come and fill your people. And people of God, go out filled with the Spirit. Go out as people of hope. Go out carrying hope. Go out being hope bearers, hope stirrers. Come on, people of God. You are the ones who have the hope that anchors your soul. And your job is to tell people, the Bible says, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within you. That's your job. So we commission you, we commission one another. We commission all of us to be the hope bearers of this city. Go out and bear hope this week. And in the difficult circumstances where you feel like, oh, my hope is nearly gone, I pray for you. We pray for one another that the Spirit of God would come and tend to your soul that he would cause to rise up in you a hope and a peace that God has got this and he has got you in the most difficult of circumstances where sickness seems to be winning. We say God is with you and we speak to sickness and say there is a greater name, the name of Jesus that is higher than any other name. And in difficult circumstances where you feel like you're trying to keep the peace, but all hell is breaking loose, may you be an anointed, prophetic peacemaker who has such hope in you that nothing will dim it. So be that hope-filled emissary of Jesus this week in our city, because we love this city. We love Bristol, and we love one another, and we love you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of the world. We welcome you into this city. We welcome you, Jesus. We welcome you, King Jesus. Thank you for all that you have done for us, all that you did for us when you went to the the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the resurrected Lord of life itself. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. It's really great to have all of you guests with us. It's been really lovely to have you here. And thank you, worship leaders. Thank you for coming. It's been good to see you. And we will, don't forget, check in this week on social media and on the website. All sorts of things are happening. And stay with it this week.